Ah, boa tarde. É, sejam todos e todas bem-vindos e bem-vindas à nossa conferência. Meu nome é Nelson Bondiola, sou pós-doutorando na Unesp de Assis, sou membro do nosso grupo de pesquisa Verdes Digitais e estarei fazendo a mediação dessa tarde para a apresentação da doutora Susan Hazan. Hazan. É, e a, eu vou passar para fazer uma é, introdução em inglês também, mas só para deixar claro desde o começo, a, a doutora é, Susan, ela disse que durante a palestra dela, as pessoas vão poder fazer perguntas a todo momento, então se sintam à vontade para, conforme ela ir falando, é, quem tiver um questionamento pode escrever e a gente avisa ela, a gente é, fala a pergunta, podem escrever em português ou podem escrever em inglês, a gente traduz para que ela possa debater é, os temas que forem perguntados. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. And good evening to all our friends abroad. My name is Nelson Bondioli. I'm a postdoc at UNESP, member of Veridas Digitais Research Group, and I'm going to be mediating today's conference. And it is truly my greatest pleasure to introduce our speaker, Dr. Susan Hazan, who, among many activities, is the chair of the European Network Association. Uh, Dr. Hazan is also Emeritus Senior Curator of New Media and Head of the Internet Office at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. And in her own words, which I found uh, very provocative, uh, she believes in transforming digital culture, investigating the digital practices that transform cultural experiences while augmenting and disrupting the very ethos of the museum to collect, conserve, stage and interpret unique physical objects. Uh, I welcome Dr. Hazan, and I'm certain we are all uh, very eager to listen to what she has to say uh, today, and uh, I'll, I'll let you speak. <laughs> thank you and welcome. Okay, thank you, Nilsson. That's great. Let me just put up my, um, my PowerPoint, make sure it's working, and then we'll get going. Sure. Ah, in the meantime, um, I just want to let everybody know that um, while um, Susan is speaking, if anyone has a question uh, and would like to, to make comments, you can write on YouTube and we will let her know to talk and answer everything. Okay, thank you. Um, I see that the way this is set up, I can't see anybody and I can't see the chat. So Angelia and, and Nelson, if you help me, please. Sure. I would love to hear from from my audience who I can't see, <laughs> Zoom are there. Maybe you can put into the, a chat, into the, a question into the chat, just so that afterwards we can read the text. Where are you? Where are you from? Just to put a little hello. So later on, when we look at the chat, we can see where you are from. At the moment, I'm talking to my screen, which is really weird, because I'd like to be talking to you. Um, I wasn't sure, can you see my image in the Yes. In the, yeah, okay. Yes, it's perfect. Okay. So I'm going to start, and I want to run this session as sort of an open session. My goal here, my subvertive goal, is to entice you all, to introduce you all to the in a, the um, Europeana Network Association, and hope that you will find a way to join us, at least online. So I'm going to sort of advocate for our um, association, our network, and tell you about the marvelous things that we all do. We really do do wonderful things, uh, with the hope that you will sign up at the end and you will join us in our future activities. So my public, my presentation is going to run through these different spots. Um, a brief history of who the network is, European Association, Network Association. Um, and then what we do, and what we do mainly is work through our communities. And their work is very interesting and very wide ranged. And we invite people to join the different communities, communities of interest, so that they can find exactly what suits their, um, their work program, their goals in life, their, their skill sets, and where people would like to improve on this journey, uh, the self-made journey, and join Europeana and learn and work with us together. Um, And uh, this is my idea to, to talk through um, this PowerPoint, this presentation. What I'm going to focus on is actually what we've been doing this year, which we've seen as a, a time for resilience. It's about rebuilding and recovering from the COVID-19 pandemic. And a little bit about our next steps, where we're going in the network, where we're heading to. So let me take you on a journey. Um, 
and all the images that you'll see are from Europeana, the collections. Uh, and I think this PowerPoint will probably go online at some point and everything is linked, everything is titled. So you can always retrace the images and find where they've come from. So enjoy European images from our collections. The association, we, we see ourselves as free, open and democratic. That's very important actually, the idea of the democratic. All the processes are internal, very democratic. And we're a community of experts and we're all working in digital cultural heritage, but we're united. And here's our shared mission to expand and improve access to Europe's digital cultural heritage. Um, this is about Europe, but it's also about all the world. Everybody is joining us from around the world uh, and is using our network as a model for other associations. So you're very, in, you're very welcome to join. Currently, we have around 3,000 members, just over 3,000 members, and it's growing um, exponentially. We normally, if you could just go back to this, we normally over the years held our conferences, our beautiful conferences. This was in Milan in 2019 in the, the National uh, Library. No, sorry, in Lisbon. We were in Lisbon. Um, and we got together in the different uh, meetings as uh, without masks <laughs> and in real meetings with real people. It was wonderful. And all our, our network came together. But this year, we held our conference just recently, a couple of weeks ago. And of course, it was held on Zoom, sadly. But we're looking forward to a time where we can get together and talk and meet and hug and have a cup of coffee together and co come with the get together in the mingling moments in between the sessions when all the real business is done. We get to know each other and we learn from each other and sit down and find out what's been happening since our previous meetup. Um, we can't really do this in Zoom, although we do try. We've set up something called Gather Town, which is a sort of social space that we tried out in our conference, and people were invited to join us as little miniature avatars in Gather Town. It didn't work too well, but it was a nice idea. Um, and here you can see one of the screens, you know, here it's four screens, I think it is, um, of the members at the at the council meeting, um, the network meeting a couple of weeks ago. So a quick history, and I won't bore you with all the history, but just to run through the, the points, it started 1995 with Gabriel, gateway to European to Europe's national libraries, and the European the European Library opened in 2004. It was a big step, an EDL project later on 2006, and then Europeana was actually launched in 2008 and has been building in strength over the years ever since. Uh, the platform is built in three areas. The Europeana uh, platform is actually the Europeana Foundation, and there's some 60 people who work in their head office in Den Haag in the, in the Netherlands. There's the Europeana Aggregators Forum, where the, these are the three pillars of Europeana. The aggregators are the ones who will uptake the collections from anybody who has a library collection, a museum or an archive internationally, and has a collection that is of interest to Europe, uh, historically or contemporary, uh, art, photography, archaeology, uh, all the fields that uh, museums and archives uh, are interested in, Europeana is interested in too. And the third pillar of the Europeana Fund, uh, the network the initiative is us, the Europeana Network Association. So we are all together, as I said, 60 staff members in the foundation. The network is over 3,000 people. I'll just put that on like this. Uh, 3,000 from other. Well, these everybody is a volunteers. They join us in their free time. They join the conferences usually for free. Our webinars, um, our task forces, our communities, uh, and it's a very open community, and everybody's welcome to join. There are 38 regional, national domain and thematic aggregators who each represent a different kind of collection, either national or thematic. And altogether, we are some 4,000 archives, libraries, museums, and other cultural heritage institutions uh, around Europe and actually around the world. So we pull in lots of collections, but it's not so much about the collections, it's about the skill sets, it's about the people and the people behind the collections and the knowledge. So that's what interests us in the initiative working together and pull, pulling in all this amazing um, experience and knowledge. 
The foundation is governed with a very small board, actually, supervisory board, seven people. And I think you met yesterday, Harry, our general director. He gave a presentation about Europeana, the initiative yesterday. And this is our governance group with Albert and Hannah and Valentin. The advisory board is 17 people. Uh, sorry, the super, supervisory board is actually a small group. And Elizabeth and Yoke are actually moving. They're leaving the board, uh, the supervisory board, and we're having, uh, we just elected two more people to the supervisory board. The advisory board uh, are made out of amazing professionals from around the world. You probably will know all these people because they're all so active um, in their different fields and their different activities. And they come together to advise Europeana and talk about our next steps. Well, also looking back a bit, but uh, our next steps for sure. So a lot of our work takes place across the communities. Now, I said that I would like um, questions and I would like responses from the audience. And as I can't see anybody, Angelia, I'd be happy if you will report to me any questions. I want to talk about the communities and I would like you to think about where you would like to join, if you would like to join all together. Um, the idea of a community is a special interest group that we cover so many areas in Europeana that we've specified specific professional areas so that people can come together and hone their skills and their experiences and share their experiences together and help us grow together. So I'm going to run through our sixth and now our seventh community, which we're celebrating, um, which is really exciting. And you'll see the breadth and the depth of the work that we do all together in the network. Uh, the first one on the left is actually our more recent one. We're very excited about the Climate Action Community. That was launched just a few weeks ago in our conference, our, our, our um, annual conference that was held online a couple of weeks ago. And I will talk about that because that's a very, very exciting new move that's, that's uh, swept up our energies and our passions um, to, ex to include our, act our work in the Climate Action Community. This is new for us and obviously it's critical. Um, and we're very happy that this was launched together with the Climate Action Manifesto. So I'll talk about that later on. The communicators community is, is a quite large community. Uh, and these are people who come together with communication skills and influence. Um, we have a lot of people who are, who are very popular on blogs, uh, who, who tw tweet a lot, uh, even on Facebook and uh, Instagram. Uh, YouTube, and these are people who are leading the conversations uh, across uh, our, our area of digital cultural heritage. And by an occasional tweet, we can sweep up an entire community and bring together a lot of people, like-minded people. And the communicators community instigate these different um, actions and in, uh, inspire others to join in. The copyright community, well, everybody knows how important copyright is. Um, and this is a, one of our older um, communities that was that was launched right in quite quite early on in our community uh, action, uh, and it's about sharing knowledge, obviously, around the topic of copyright in the cultural heritage section. And I'll talk about that specifically in a minute. Our research community is is open to um, universities and research communities, and the education is focused more on schools of the different age groups. The Europeana tech community is the probably the first community that we had. Um, and their Europeana tech is a brand in itself um, with years of fantastic um, conferences and meetings and coming together to share uh, our, our, our information and our, informa our, our experiences in the R&D section uh, and in sector. And last but not least, obviously a very important community is the impact community. Uh, we look at the way the, the, our work is through surveys and through our actions, our own actions, create an impact on our work. And we actually measure this. And we have a, what we call our impact playbook. Um, and it looks at ways we can, we can measure these activities and bring them back into a cyclic um, way of uh, learning from any action that we do so that we can replicate, we can improve, and we can share. So I'll talk a little bit about that. The communities break down to pretty equal groups. 
uh, impact is quite a large group. The biggest one is research, it's university research. Uh, you won't see the um, the climate group here because it's too new. It's it's fresh off the press. It's a month old. But the other communities that are represented here, education, uh, all running between 1,000, 2,000 members individually, collectively. Um, the way that we work is through either working groups or task forces. A task force is a very specific short-term task. Uh, for example, uh, the, uh, the audiovisual play out in Europeana or the digital transformation task. Uh, it's a, it <clears throat> has a beginning and an end uh, and has a very focused goal at the end. So people come together and join a task force like the Digital Transformation Task Force uh, or they'll join a committee, the Data Quality Committee. And for a short and limited time, they will work on a very specific task. On the other hand, there are working groups and the working groups are permanent entities. We continue uh, through the months. Uh, a fairly recent one is the, the inner, the, the European Network Association membership working group, which looks at issues of how people enter uh, European network and how they are onboarded, how they progress through the different activities, how they make their contributions and how the contributions are received. Um, that's quite an interesting uh, working group. It's fa fairly new. And the governance, obviously, we have to have a governance working group and the work that they do there is incredibly important. It keeps us all together and sane. And the uh, IIIF working group is obviously focused on IIIF activities. So these are different ways that we come together in Europeana. As some examples of the task forces. Recently we ran a fabulous uh, task force. I don't know, has anybody, have a, has anybody take, taken part in our task forces, I'd like to hear, or in our community actions altogether? Is anybody a member of Europeana? If so, I'd love to hear. Uh, this very popular task force of uh, Europeana as a platform for storytelling uh, produced research and recommendations based on examples of interesting, engaging and effective storytelling practices found around the web. So we had a series of case studies. Uh, it was run beautifully by Beth with about, I think about 20 people uh, meeting on a regular basis with wonderful outcomes, uh, producing case studies and uh, the research behind it, what makes a platform of storytelling powerful. That was actually quite an interesting question to look at because we have collections in Europeana, we have exhibitions, we have blogs, and we have all sorts of activities. But behind all the collections are the stories that we tell. We found that as powerful as the stories become, so our message is clearer in education and in research, in tourism and everything we do, if we can spin a story around the collections, we have a much more powerful way of uh, using Europe's, Europe's rich collections from you know, over the years. So that was quite an important um, new uh, task force that was run. The labeling for cultural heritage was uh, very interesting. And a new the new professional task force uh, asked the questions, what do we do with our with new members, with new members who come in? How do we attract new members? How do we keep uh, European <clears throat> open and interesting to all our new professionals? I was at a conference today in Tel Aviv. We, they were talking about the, the problem with the juniors coming into high tech. Juniors are usually not very welcome, and they should be, because uh, here in Israel anyway, there's a, a problem bringing high tech uh, individuals, highly qualified individuals, into the into the workspace and juniors need a lot of mentoring and support but if you don't mentor your young professionals your new professionals you're never going to get them into the workforce and there's going to be a dire lack of membership uh, of in the workforce so we looked at the new professionals and what their needs are and how we could meet their needs and help them enter their their working spaces in their individual countries um <clears throat> so Basically, what is a community and how I just express it in these different terms of reference, it's mission driven. In other words, we have a specific goal that we kind of rally around. Uh, and it, the idea is to, op to open up new opportunities to, to benefit the professional needs and interest of their members. Any member can suggest 
uh, a community, not a community, but a task force um, and a working group um, and can promote it and galvanize the group together, bring people together to work together. And it has to come in accordance with the Europeana initiative, the strategy, obviously, but uh, I think once people get into Europeana, it's pretty clear where we're heading. Anybody in the, in the network can join. And if you haven't joined, then please do. And all our work is based uh, on voluntary work, which I think is amazing. As the chair of all these 3,000 people, um, I'm in awe that the amount of time and energy and skills people are prepared to contribute to Europe, to Europeana. It always amazes me how people are happy to join us, to um, join in a webinar, to work on one of the task forces, to give their free time or their professional time uh, to joining, uh, to, to contributing to Europeana. But at the same time, there's an awful lot to be gained. And if people are active in one of the work, for, work task forces or the communities, there's so much knowledge that spins around but this is the wonderful opportunity to learn from our contemporaries, uh, our colleagues. So on one hand, there's this kind of contribution. On the other hand, there's this reception of amazing ideas, skills, um, and experiences that is shareable. And that's what gives us the resilience. That's what gives us the strength. We work together to be inclusive, collaborative, caring, and respectful. Uh, this is something that's really important. I've written a number of blogs on how to work together. Uh, I have a, um, an article coming out in Digitalia next week, I hope, on mindfulness and cultural heritage. And I believe that being caring and, and respectful in our workplace, uh, especially after these exhausting months of the uh, pandemic, is our priority at the moment. It's to support each other in collaborations, to be caring and to be respectful. So these are goals, actually. They're not sort of byproducts. These are the goals of the network. And the communities actually grow organically, which is rather nice, because there's internal, external initiatives. And each group, as you'll see in a minute, has their own methodologies and work plans. And it depends on the different characters and needs and the audiences, because each community is different. But let me just read this last statement, which I think is critical. A community thrives when everyone takes responsibility and contributes what they do best. So I think that's actually very true and important. So I'm going to run through our different communities and hopefully I'll find a hook for you to join us and to come in uh, in whatever interest you specifically. Oh, Susan. Yes. Uh, uh, we have um, actually a question. Yay. Uh, since uh, uh, you are talking about, well, we have people from all over the Brazil. Uh, we have some people from Europe watching us. Then uh, later I can tell you uh, the cities that you asked for. But uh, just before you, you continue, since you, you said you wanted to, to, ask, to talk with the public, uh, there, and you are talking about how uh, the community of Europeana tries to be uh, inclusive and democratic. There is a question on the chat that I think it's worth, uh, it's worth taking a look, which is, uh, what is the European position about decolonization? <laughs> ooh, ooh, ooh. Okay, this is a new one for us. Um, <clears throat> this, is, this is a very difficult question to ask because this is, this is one of my bees in my bonnet, as they say. Yeah, um, yeah it's, it's uh, since Black Life Matters, uh, exploded on the cultural heritage as seen a couple of years ago. You'll see and you'll hear that institution, cultural institutions, looking backwards into their collections and looking at their uh, post-colonial moment. And this is <clears throat> a very problematic moment. And it's something that we have to look at in the context, how can I explain this, in the context of the history that it came about, but not to necessarily accept uh, the status quo that was uh, carried forward through a tradition <clears throat> of replication. So in Europeana, we're looking at collections in new ways and, and trying to, <clears throat> sorry, trying to identify what went wrong. <laughs> Why try to identify where all this, uh, all the problematics crept in um, historically, and we can't change history but we can recognize history. 
And I think one of the points that we're working on in our um, in our in our blogs and our <clears throat> our exhibitions that we do, you'll see there's some very interesting exhibitions on uh, Black Lives Matter, uh, LGB communities, um, communities that weren't necessarily put into the limelight, uh, and they're now being openly discussed and uh, celebrated in Europeana. We're beginning to look at things in a different way, but. This is not something we can accommodate in a short time. This mm. is a revelation that we have a process to go through. I've been chair. I've been chairing the association for a year. This is something we started talking about a year ago. We've come to recognition. We need to do something, and we are now trying to do that something together. But that's a whole new lecture. I'd be happy to come back and give another lecture when we have. Um, mm -hmm. We have some more information, but meantime, we've made some very good uh, things, very, very good uh, starting points, but we have a long way to go. I think all, you know, all museums and, and collection, libraries and collections have to review their collections internationally and look, about, look to how we represent the past and reframe it and think about the multi-voices. History can be spoken from more than one voice. For example, there's history and there's her history. Her story, uh -huh. where, where are all the women? Uh, I personally were looking forward to doing something about researching what happened to all the women on the route. But again, that's another story. Let me leave it like this. There is an awareness and understanding um, and we're making the first steps and I'd be very happy to present them or people in the European community who's their speciality could present them because we have a very good team working in European on this. Okay. Thank you for the question. Is there any others or should I continue? Uh, you can continue, please. Thank you. Okay, let me jump into the Europeana tech community. Well, you tech is out there. You probably belong to this community, but you didn't even know it because it's become uh, so well known. And people kind of link, you know, get their, their weekly or monthly um, newsletter or they come across some, I mean, let's go through this, um, in LinkedIn or uh, the newsletter. And you probably don't even know that you belong to it because everybody is in the Europeana tech community. Basically, it's a community of experts, developers, researchers, the R&D sector, which makes sure that the European Initiative, that's all of us, leads the way uh, with technology innovation with, within cultural heritage and helps heritage organizations to apply the technology. So in my, my personal, my, my professional life, uh, I was uh, for many, many years a curator of new media. And this is exactly the dovetailing of these two sectors that need to come together, the curation of the content and the technology and innovation that needs to um, support the content, uh, the quality content of digital cultural heritage. So this is what's happening in the Europeana tech community. The community has nearly 2,000 members and, nearly, and um, a mailing list. And on Twitter, there's 4,718 Twitters on the Twitter account, and you're well, welcome to join in. Just note the the handle at uh, Europeana Tech. Everybody should be there because all the hot stuff comes there. Comes off there. Um, just to take a look at our um, our members, <clears throat> not the members. Sorry, we have two thousand members. This is the steering group uh, from Europeana. Uh, we have man we have a manage we have three managers. It's a very large group. And these are the, the members. So I won't repeat, I won't read everything, but I just want to make sure that every time I mention a community, I recognize the different people who are running the community because there's a lot of work being done behind the scenes. And sometimes just recognition is all they have and a little thank you for the work they do. So what have they been doing this year in the task forces and the working groups? There was a wonderful series of webinars on AI but in relation to GLAMS, uh, you may have caught one of the webinars. If not, everything is online in terms of recordings. Very, very good series there. Interoperability of annotations and user sets. It's important to all of us who are trying to bring collections together, make them uh, useful and findable in terms of annotations. Uh, the playout, the audiovisual playout in Europeana, that's very important. Uh, it's an evolving area that needs an awful lot of work, but there's a group of people who are dedicated to make this happen. 
and then the IIIF and the Europeana Tech, who are focused on the work there. And the last particular task force that I want to recognize is the Data Quality Committee. So these are all the work that's going on behind the scenes to make Europeana what it is. Um, so the themes at this moment that interest this particular group is the multilingualism and language technology. And this uh, artificial intelligence is such a broad term, but nobody really knows what it means. Um, everybody's throwing it in, you know, oh yeah, we do AI, we've got AI in our project, but do they really know what it means? So this group is actually focusing on how AI can help the, uh, the, the heritage community. Uh, there's I, a triple IF for the aggregators, that's very important, where they, they bring the introduced collections into Europeana with all the data quality issues. And last spring, the webinars uh, on AI were so successful, there's a new series planned for 2022, so don't make, so make sure you don't miss them. And some of the ideas that European Tech are focusing on in the future is the new Europe, the Horizon Europe projects, uh, the Technology and Starts project, including storytelling, which become really important for Europeana, uh, distributed infrastructures, uh, integrating into the Time Machine projects, and then obviously working with Wikidata in GLAMS. So let me move on to the next community, research community. This is a wonderful picture. It's a wonderful, serious guy. But I just wanted you to see, he has a cigarette in his hand. You're not going to see that these days, are you? <laughs> He seems to be writing in his ledger with his ink pen with a cigarette. I think it's a cigarette. Anyway, that's a really strange picture. And I'm not adv advocating uh, smoking here. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have in the research community over 2,000 members. They're a community of professionals interested in cultural heritage, both as a subject okay, and as a source of research. That's important. It's just objects not just objects, but the processes behind them. And the research community aims to foster the use of digital cultural heritage in research, obviously, and the communities, uh, community members are from the heritage section a third and a quarter, well, let's say about a quarter from academic research and about another quarter from higher education. That's the breakdown of the research community. And let me introduce you to our wonderful research community steering group. Uh, again, I won't through. I won't mention their names because you can read that yourself. But uh, I just know in, individually and collectively how much work they do behind the scenes, and I would like to salute everybody. Um, again, this is voluntary and it's taking up time, but it's incredibly important. Uh, the research community's goals are such: to strengthen the connections between cultural heritage and research. Okay, that's very specific, um, and. It's a way of getting members to gain a better understanding of research that's based on digital cultural heritage. And it's called here computational methods of digital tools. But you all know what we mean. Uh, we share knowledge and experience, promote digital literacy. That's really, I would like to give a lecture on digital literacy, actually. It's, it's the key probably to everything we do. It isn't about scanning an object. It isn't about uh, writing a blog. Digital literacy is what we believe in, that the entire sector of, of uh, cultural heritage, uh, you need to be digitally literate in, in able to enable to uh, maintain um, your, your, acts, your actions um, in, in, in this case, research community. That's that skill set that needs to be taught. And then one of the focuses this year has been the potential of citizen science, which is really interesting, because it means it's open collections, open publications, shared knowledge, um, and vast databases where people can join in and uh, transcribe things together. <clears throat> and another factor that the community has, another goal they have, is a commitment to take actions that have an impact on policy. I like that goal, I think it's very good. Um, they had enormous, um, well, not enormous, 400 people, but that's actually quite good, a symposium in May uh, uh, with professional uh, policymakers and academics and researchers, the different groups coming together. Uh, and everything we do on European and the network is recorded and it is documented. It means you can go back and watch all these videos. So when you're bored and you're in between, um, 
let's say, um, watching television or reading your newspaper or on the train or whatever, you have a free moment, put your earplugs in and go and listen to one of our videos or recordings uh, on Europeana Pro. It's great stuff there. Uh, the report, the task force report came out this year, uh, a survey on uh, the reuse of digital cultural heritage about accessing and processing and publishing the, the cultural heritage assets and data sets and the different problems that uh, obviously we all face. Skills and training and then the awareness of the Europeana Open Science Cloud, that's uh, another focus. Again, you can find the report on Europeana. So if this is something that says, hmm, yeah, I really need to read that, that's something that's really going to help me in my daily work, then you can find it on European. Susan? Yes? Uh, I got a question. Uh, does Great. European offer training on, on digital um, manipulation? Okay. Until now, we've offered informal webinars and conferences and meetups, things like that. We're now moving into more formalized training in certain areas. Uh, one of the areas is in leadership in the field. Another area is going to be in climate action. Um, and these are now, these programs are being created now behind the scenes. And we are moving more and more into training activities, which we'll be able to announce hopefully in a few weeks. But I see this happening behind the scenes, and I think this is great, because Europeana has an awful lot to share. One of the things we're discussing is the certification of our different courses, so that if people do train in Europeana and they take the time to take a course, they have a certification, professional certification at the end. So that's something we're looking into at the moment. But um, it'll take time, but it's happening behind the scenes. Uh, and just so uh, a personal question then, uh, are this type of certification and training, will they be free too, or they will be charged? How do you deliver, will be the, the model of it? I can't tell you at the moment. The, the, uh, as far as the model at the moment is free, but I don't know how that's sustainable that is, so we have to look into that. But okay. certainly in our pilots, they're going to be free. And later on, when we start building long-term training um, activities, then we will think about probably a nominal price. I don't think uh, we're interested in, in making money here. We're trying to be sustainable so that we can keep this going. Um, I don't have an answer to that. And it's something I will take back and, and bring to our council and we'll talk about that in our council. We have a meeting tomorrow. Something sure. we can talk about tomorrow. <laughs> Thank you. Any other questions? Yep, you can continue, please. Yeah, please keep the questions going, coming, coming, not going, coming, because uh, it helps me focus. I can't see anybody. I don't know if you're all asleep or not. I have no idea. So, no, you know, uh, we're, we're very awake. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I will continue. Now to education. So this is who our, our steering group are. Um, and I will say thank you to everybody here for doing amazing work. Uh, an awful lot of work has been done in education and again I'm not going to mention all the names but you probably have come across everybody's name uh, somewhere in the field because they're very loud and powerful in what they do so anybody who's in education and would like to make a contribution then contact this particular group. So what have they done recently? Well education uh, affects everybody. Uh, there are in Facebook there are 5,000 followers in LinkedIn, there are 1,000 followers. Um, and then the members in the educated, the actual members are one, over, over 1,000. And the listserv, I can't remember how num number it is, the number's hidden here, but there's a very large listserv. So they have lots of different communication activities and ways to get their uh, activities um, disseminated across the web. Some of the activities they, they did, they took part in this year, the Porto Santo Charter, a very important charter that took place um, actually in Portugal, uh, and discussing democratization from, of, of cultural democracy and rethinking institutions and practices. This is a process that's going on at the moment uh, across the sector about democrat, democratizing, <laughs> democratizing um, our collections um, to make things more accessible, to make things more um, uh, fair um, and rethinking how institutions work together. 
This is the opening of a beginning steps of a process, and uh, it's something that we'll take with us in the years to come. Now, the way this happened, because uh, of the pandemic, in our tradition of meeting together in, in different countries, in different cities, in different offices, you know, obviously everything went online. Uh, and this is a, um, a, Miro, a Miro board that we use. I'm sure you've all moved to digital tools. We we'll use Miro boards on obviously Zoom, any tool that we can, we can move to that helps us communicate together, stay together. Um, and this was a debate uh, that came out of the, the, the Porto Santo Charter, where one of the, con one of the conversations was in the virtual debate was words matter. And that's incredibly important because when you use words, do you understand the power that, you, that your words have? And in democrati democratizing uh, cultural heritage, words are a very, very important tool. This was discussed online and uh, the Myra boards are still available. You can see the process, um, as well as uh, documenting uh, the outcomes, the impact of what we do. Our processes are usually uh, record, we can, are recorded and accessible. Um, this is the Asian Europeana perspective. Uh, and uh, European is, is, seeks to make uh, connections across the world, not just Europe. And this was a seminar that took place in the summer with quite a lot of uh, participation, opening up a lot of new um, opportunities and avenues for educators um, in, in Asia, across Asia. Uh, stories and collecting. Uh, this was a very nice workshop that took place online. Uh, in the social sciences, humanities and social sciences net, uh, about storing and collecting to promote cultural heritage. I'll run through a bit faster, I think, because I have quite a lot to get through. Uh, I like this particular one, the water awareness webinar that took place. Uh, and you could look at the quality of, of the work that was done in the, in the comics here and how the education awareness on, on her of water uh, took place. Uh, in Romania, the course online was in Romanian, I'm sure I can't tell you much about that because I can't read it, but my wonderful uh, contemporaries Olympia and uh, Christina, I know, are, <laughs> are incredibly um, talented people and if they, were, if they ran this course then it must have been really useful. So if anybody there speaks Romanian, then please contact uh, our Romanian um, members, council members. Uh, copyright office hours. I'll talk about that when I get to copyright. But this was a, a shared copyright office hour meeting between copyright and education. So there's a specific questions about copyright and education, which are very different from the generic questions about copyright. There's a, a whole different set of usage. So in May, there was a, a very nice online seminar. So um, these, these calls took place every six weeks. These were not recorded. Uh, our office hours are not recorded because uh, they're very kind of um, uh, intense meetings and people are very free to speak. So this is probably an exception where our meetings uh, are not recorded, but that they are, uh, there's reports. You can read the reports on them. Uh, a wonderful program built with bits, which is still going on. Uh, it's an educational program across different schools, uh, different, uh, there's a competition. Uh, and uh, using Minecraft, schools were mentored uh, into using cultural heritage of our collections in Europeana, bringing them into Minecraft and creating their new worlds. So this was a lovely activity. Um, and in a couple of weeks, I think, in, in January, there's the uh, the final um, some slide on this. Um, there's a, the workshop. The final the final workshop will be uh, exhibiting the results of these projects um, that were built with bits. So these are educational activities in Minecraft. Lovely experience for, for education for children in schools. So copyright. We can't finish this without copyright. The roundup here. So the copyright community aims, aims to aid practitioners in, in, in a very professional support in the cultural heritage sector to navigate copyright in the collections don't we all need a little compass to navigate our collections and help them or us advocate for adequate institutional support around copyright and lastly to provide guidance 
about how to contribute to adequate legal frameworks in their countries. And you know, all across Europe, every legal frameworks are, different, are all different. And this is something that needs to be negotiated um, between the institution and institution, country and country. And the copyright community are specs in this. Meet the steering group, these wonderful people. Um, I haven't seen these people in months. I haven't sat down and had a cup of coffee with anybody in months. And I miss everybody terribly because traditionally we'd sit down and uh, have our meetings, you know, face to face in a room and thrash out all our differences and all expectations and bring together our different um, experiences. But, you know, we're just saying hello to these little windows on the other side of the world <laughs> in over, over Zoom or however it is we meet. Um, I actually miss all these people. So let me take you to the penultimate group. Any questions, by the way, Nelson? Um, no, you can continue. Uh, people yeah. also have a little bit delay, but I think on the copyright, uh, people will be interested. I know I am. Uh, I have a few questions, but I'll, I'll wait for you to talk about. Uh, so copyright uh, has got a very nice group. Uh, there's 1,000 subscribers to the mailing list, 1,737 Twitter followers, and if you'd like to take their tweet handle, Europe at Europeana, uh, Europeana IPR, so you can follow the conversations. They all happen first on Twitter for some reason. They break on Twitter, and then you kind of go back and follow the links, and you see where the conversations took place. This is a very active community and uh, an awful lot going on. Some of the things they did this year was the webinars, very good webinars. There's a community work plan um, and there's a how to guide for labeling cultural heritage. That's incredibly important. And how to use copyright when sharing data. Uh, copyright tools and resources and uh, everything you wanted to ask about copyright and didn't know where to ask your question. And where you can ask your question are the copyright office hours. So they, we support each other with these different challenges. Um, copyright office hours meet every six weeks. Um, again, this is, I don't think these are recorded, but it means that you can come together with your colleagues and in an informal discussion and ask the questions you're too embarrassed to ask anywhere else. Um, and the new series is starting in February, which has had a very successful, very popular series. So come back in February and join the Copyright Office Hours. The Labelling Task Force, that was a very difficult um, project, very successful. Um, and this is all documented online. You can go back and into the, um, into the page of the European Copyright Community and trace all this information. And this is the labeling task force. And that work, they worked for months on this to bring this together. And one fun thing was an Open Glam translation sprint. And uh, the sprint meant people came together in real time and organized a translation with 34 translations of our public domain related documents um, and bringing these people together at the same, in the same time and having people transcribe and uh, work together was, was thrilling, absolutely thrilling. So the result was 34 translations, but the process was an absolute delight. So highly recommend uh, Open Glam translation sprints because they're fun, they're useful, and they're very important. So the management guidelines that uh, we keep repeating and rebuilding um, are actually available and you can, can follow them online. They, they are a living process. They change as things evolve. And our communication tools of copyright uh, are available sort of online booklets, celebrating the multilingual public domain. That's quite important for our goals this year. Uh, the artificial intelligence and copyright, the copyright reform, in education, uh, orphan works, we all know how difficult that is to manage, and the problem, the missed deadline, the state of play of copyright director. So directive, um, <clears throat> is that these are materials that are available to the public that uh, have come out of European copyright activities. Okay, impact communities, that's a lovely image. <laughs> they are walking and as they walk with their flags, they are making impact. What does it mean to be an impact member of the community? 
There are a community of professionals interested in the impact of the cultural heritage sector on the people who interact with its actions and services. So as a group, we're eager to discuss the value of impact and the challenges that we face when assessing it. If you've ever, in, if you've ever measured the impact of any of your projects, you'll know how satisfying this, pro this activity is. It's not so much about doing something, it's understanding the value of what you've done and being able to uh, replicate it in the future in terms of success or failure. And if you don't do that, then you will never learn and you'll stay exactly where you are. So the impact community specialise in how to uh, value, evaluate um, different processes and actions. And their aim is to constantly improve the daily work so that it's in line with the needs of audiences and other relative stakeholders. Um, they support members to develop and refine the practice of impact assessment. Did you know there's a practice of impact? Hands up in the audience who practices impact assessment and awareness. Do we have anybody in chat? Are there any professionals as this is their daily work, measuring impact and awareness? No, I don't know. I can't see, but hopefully there are people out there because if they're not, you should have somebody in your organization to do exactly that. And if you need the tools, then come to European Impact Community and pick up the tools and take them back to your office. So contributing to the ongoing development of impact practitioners and the transfer of knowledge and shared skills, tools and resources around impact. And to communicate with our networks and audiences beyond the community to the importance of value of impact assessment and the utility of the impact toolkit playbook. The series of playbooks, I think number three has come out now, and these are these are uh, enable you to run assessment and uh, evaluation processes uh, as a group or individually, and to have tools that you can actually measure your impact. Very, very useful, actually quite fun to do. And here's our wonderful steering group. Uh, I don't have pictures of everybody here. Oh, it's, really, it's a shame. Anyway, these are people who have come together and who are promoting impact and working together to create the different playbooks and the tools that are available. The community has a page on Pro with all the tools on it, a monthly, a bi-monthly, sorry, a bi-monthly newsletter, listserv, and a LinkedIn group. So if you don't have a, uh, if you don't do anything else and you don't have impact in your uh, institution, then join at least one of these groups. You'll learn an awful lot. Um, the tools and resources include the, the, the impact playbook. You can download that for free and you can start using that tomorrow or tonight. If you don't want to wait till tomorrow, you can join the webinars. Uh, you can learn about the case studies and the work plans. And there's a light task force, an impact light task force you can join or you can learn about. And a new project that's um, around the idea of impact is the Indices project. So we're bringing that on board with the results of that project in the moment. The impact webinars, uh, these are links. So if this is available, uh, the PowerPoint is available, you can click on the links. These are the reports uh, and the link to the symposium and the question bank, which is really important. And the this is the new impact playbook, which has now been reviewed and published, phase three. So all these blue links are very, yes, they're all live links. So download this um, PowerPoint before you go home. Make sure you have it available at work tomorrow and start creating impact in your work, in your daily routine. Let's move on to the communicators. Any questions, Nelson? Um, actually, uh, I have one about the copyrights, because I think that it probably, the, I don't know, most the time consuming aspect <laughs> of everything, I, I believe. Uh, it, it, would it be a correct assessment to, to think that, that copyrights uh, it's probably the most problematic area. I think if you're proficient and you know what you're doing, it's very quick mm -hmm. because you know what you're doing. You need to imbibe the rules of copyright and understand the processes. And once you have them at your fingertips, then it's actually very easy. But if you think about the, um, it, the, the area of copyright without that knowledge, it's, it's pretty scary because you can get lost. Yeah. But, hey, why not learn it? You know, why not take a, 
download you know some of our webinars or some of our reports um, and find out how easy it is once you know what you're doing. Mm. I must admit this is not my field and I still am shy of um, activating the copyright um, regulations and I will probably defer to another colleague mm -hmm. but uh, there are enough people in Europeana who this is their speciality um, and they can give us guidance and help us get through navigate this kind of <clears throat> very messy forest of uh, options. Okay, should I, I continue to communicate us? Yes, please. Okay, this community community is a specialist community, 1,500 professionals who work in and around communications in the cultural and heritage section. Now, what does that mean? Because we all communicate, don't we? But this is a bunch of people who are passionate about promoting digital cultural heritage and action and we support each other to be the best communicators we can. Communicating something is just as important as doing it. If you don't communicate, disseminate what you've done, nobody else will know about it. It's like that phrase, you know, if a tree falls from the forest and nobody's there to hear it, did the tree fall? So communicators have an incredibly important task to share activities, and in our case, to share European activities, um, beyond our little silo of uh, Europeana activities and move to shunt our activities beyond those walls and share them beyond Europeana um, space or network. Um, this is our group. Uh, I'm happy to be a, a co-chair here, so <laughs> this is something that's very close to my heart. I like communicating, you may have noticed, but I like communicating. Um, this is our wonderful group. Uh, Peter Sommers is the chair, um, and I, again, I can't name everybody because I will never get through all this, but uh, I'm incredibly proud of the work um, that, that this group is doing. So what do we do? We support, we contribute to European knowledge by supporting the development and promotion of training resources and tools or activities. So if we've got it, we want to tell you about it, because there's no point in having a training resource or a tool or an activity unless you know about it. So that's one of the things that we see as a priority. And upskilling, uh, we equip members with digital communication skills in our storytelling uh, task force, for example. Uh, we inspire. Okay, so we like to share examples of digital culture in action. We have fun on Twitter. Uh, we do all sorts of uh, activities um, around memes, uh, workshops on memes. Um, and uh, Twitter sessions, uh, and we find fun ways to disseminate uh, European in all sorts of strange ways, but actually a lot of fun. And we make these connections. We try to be an excellent communication hub between community members and Europeana. This also extends beyond our uh, European initiative, because one of the most important things once we've connected between the members and the different pillars of Europeana, we need to extend these actions beyond the communities. So some of the activities that happened this year was a digital storytelling task force. And what came out of that was a series of 10 tips and resources. Um, if you want to learn about this, about storytelling and what we learned from storytelling, download uh, the reports, the webinars. So, so much fun, this particular task force run by Beth Daly. Um, uh, to understand what we're doing in the community, obviously we have lots of surveys, and I'm sure everybody's bored by surveys now, but they're critical to understand what our community members need and want. Uh, we have presentations and blog posts and um, regular tracking of questions and requests of community members. Uh, let me see if I have this page. Yeah, the 1,200 sub subscribers on the monthly newsletter, the mailing list, LinkedIn group, uh, community pages everybody else has and European Pro, and the email and social media accounts of the steering group. And uh, we all um, support each other and tweet all the time or in Instagram or whatever it is. So um, we will use each other's handles to kind of uh, augment our voices um, and set things out. So if somebody has you know, a few hundred or possibly a thousand of um, uh, followers, if we use their handle on tweet on Twitter, we extend our reach um, exponentially. So that's something we we understand the process and really enjoy using. 
So we develop professional skills with access to communication tools, resources and training, and we try and keep up to date with the latest communication news from our sector. Um, and you can, we find, we're trying to find ways of bringing other people's calls and actions from uh, alternative sectors into the community. And our goal is to share across, to connect our community across Europe, but actually beyond. And you guys are the beyond. So guys, beyond, come and join us and uh, see what our community does. Um, that's Brazil. I mean, anybody out there in Brazil, anywhere else that's Europe, are more than welcome. And you too can expand your network in the cultural heritage sector. Okay, I've come to our last but not least climate action group. Our last community is actually a group um, that turned into a community just three weeks ago, I think, uh, with the realization that we need to take uh, supportive and critical action to do something in our field of digital cultural heritage to combat uh, what's happening to uh, our climate. So who, who we are, the professionals at all levels who work in the digital cultural heritage se uh, sector, and we acknowledge, and this is something that we acknowledge very publicly and very vociferously, that climate change is an emergency. We believe that the cooperative action is required to reverse the momentum. So we're looking for ways to drive impactful, cooperative and sustainable action to address the climate emergency and the environmental impact of our life and our work and in our digital transformation of the cultural sector. And we aim for, for wider systemic change within our organizations and networks. So this is an open invitation to join. If you care about your climate, not your climate, our climate. Uh, we have some very interesting good practice recommendations, uh, how to choose um, a survey, uh, sorry, a server that is not producing vast uh, quantities of carbon into the air, how you can uh, do a cleanup of your data, very practical steps you can take in your institu institution about uh, reducing your carbon footprint and your impact on the climate in the area of digital cultural heritage. It's a, it's a very small area, but we have some very important um, steps to take. And this is one of the areas we're going to create training processes on, because we feel that through our own experience, we have a lot to share. And in the cultural heritage sector, the digital sector, um, Europeana has um, uh, monitored and um, created uh, regulations and recommendations for the sector, which we hope to share in the near future. This is really quite new. So Mapping Climate Action in Arts and Culture uh, was organized by the original, the, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the um, European Network Association Climate Action Group, um, which, which grew uh, from our meeting in Lisbon two years ago. Uh, one of the first things they did was the mapping of the climate action. You can see that uh, online and how to organize a green event. So that was actually a very interesting project. And uh, Europeana as such has now become uh, a sustainable green institution in terms of their, uh, their kitchen, in terms of an impact across our whole sector and it's continuing to do so. Uh, just a month ago, we uh, announced, we launched our manifesto for climate action, which is all about planning, collaborating, operational, and advocating. And this was a very nice celebrating morning moment. And you see here Barbara here, she's our um, climate action activist who has led um, this process um, for, for more than two years uh, with other people in that group, with Killian and Peter. Um, and this is uh, Harry, who we met, I think, yesterday. He's our director of Europeana. Uh, and uh, uh, and my, who is our... Uh, sometimes feels like free fall into a swimming pool. That's me up there jumping in. But knowing there's thousands of people below me to share these activities together. We work as a group, we work as um, a very potent uh, network of people. So it's actually incredibly pleasurable and fascinating to work with so many amazing people. 
Our priorities this year are about, uh, they change from time to time, this is what we announced at the beginning of the year, about supporting capacity building in digital and in digital transformation. And uh, of particular interest to me was looking at the potential of our members when they are brought into or come into, they enter into the, the network, what happens in that process, what they do, where they can uh, contribute, what they get out of it, what they need, what they want. Uh, our inclusivity and diversity program took off this year. And uh, there's been a lot of impact on how we've changed our, um, our um, the way we look at uh, our community in terms of inclusive inclusivity and diversity. And you'll see this in the blogs and in the curatorial work, in our meetings, in our choice of speakers. Um, that's something I'm very proud of that's happening this year and will continue. Uh, our collaboration with the foundation has just grown and now we work together with the Aggregators Forum across wider networks. And most important, we are transparent accountable and democratic and obviously there's lots of work that has to be done in funding and payments and stuff and the different mechanisms but that probably doesn't interest you that much and if it does you can contact me um privately so the task forces that emerged this year this digital leadership program the innovation development program uh, which is fairly new the european capacity building framework and it's just taken off now, digital transformation, the task force, what we mean by digital transformation, how can we support this across the sector, and our cross-initiative task force on diversity and inclusion. And our, the last one is this new membership group that uh, I'm chairing that uh, looks at the process of how people join the network and what they do where they get there. I'm probably repeating myself now, but that's one of, one of my babies that I really care about. Uh, in the beginning of November, we had our annual conference, and it was about recovering, rebuilding, and growing. Uh, very, very successful. And what we're looking forward to in the next year is the to produce further benefit to our members of being part of the Europeana family, and to become an exemplary model for the whole cultural heritage sector and beyond, and to build on our powerful instruments, our council, our communities, working groups and task forces. This is what we do, we will continue to do, we will build on these tools. And I'm extremely proud of the work that we do. Uh, and more aspirations in our strategy for the future, the near future, is to, to build on the Green Deal in our climate action, uh, the new European Bauhaus, uh, which is very inspirational. It's about beauty. It's about building, living together, sharing together. Um, a digital space for culture, an evolving European digital space for culture that Europeana is, is supporting and uh, spearheading. And the digital transformation capacity building, which is an ongoing um, act or set of actions that we do to support our sector. So why would you want to join us? Well, I haven't made it obvious, then I really done a disservice to our network. You have lots of reasons to join us. So why not, <laughs> is my question. Europeana is, the, is Europe's platform for digital cultural heritage. We empower the cultural heritage sector in digital transformation. Our website uh, is uh, built from uh, 4,000 institutions across Europe. It's all available for free online. And we work to share and promote this heritage, our shared heritage, so it can be used and enjoyed by people across the world. And teachers and learners can find images, text, audio, video, also 3D, and anything from art to science in over, wait for this, 37 languages, including Portuguese. So go search with over um, 80 million ob uh, objects, items in the collection, and 20 million is openly licensed and can freely, freely reuse for education purposes. So those are some good reasons why you should join us. And if you would like to see the benefits more specifically, you can join a community, you can collaborate with our colleagues and your colleagues, you can lead your community, make a difference and influence the sector, keep informed, and of course to participate in events. And here is the sign up page. 
you haven't found it already, because I'm sure as I've been speaking, you've been running, where's Europeana, where's the sign up page? And when I get back to my system tomorrow morning, I will see hundreds of people have just signed up from all over Brazil, hopefully. So at this point, I'll just say thank you. And uh, we hope to see you in one of our events or our task forces or communities in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Susan. Um, I think you, you showed us uh, great reasons indeed. And there are a lot of comments, people saying it was um, a very interesting uh, conference, people saying uh, that they learned a lot. Um, <laughs> that it was an incredible uh, conference. And we also have a question from uh, Eduardo, and he wants to know who gives uh, European support to deal with these questions concerning uh, climate problems? Uh, I believe I, I will extrapolate, but I think he's probably asking if there is any connection to organizations or even politi politicians or anything like that. Yeah, this is, these actions are all networked across the sector. Um, nobody can act alone. Uh, we just joined the different actions. Um, and uh, I, I'm just trying to think of the name. There's, there's a series of initiatives that we have already joined and we will be joining and this will all be available on our Europeana Pro site in the future. Um, as this com Tomorrow we'll have a meeting, a long, a full day meeting, um, and we will just have to vote through all these processes tomorrow as a group. And once this has gone through our meeting tomorrow, the, the board and the council, this will go online. So this is going to happen tomorrow, basically. Um, but it's all fresh, so it's rather nice, actually. Yeah, there's lots of climate action, and we have to work together in the sector. But we have a very special voice, because our voice is about the digital aspect of cultural heritage. Um, and that's what we think is important in our contribution. That's uh, where we come in. I see. Uh, thank you. Uh, I hope uh, this answered the question. Uh, Eduardo, if you want to, to know more, you can, you can say. Uh, yeah, of course. yeah. Uh, I also have a question about uh, the impact because you you talked um, a, a lot about it, and but what I want to know is if you could briefly just tell us a little bit about um, how do you how do you define impact? Like how do you define European impact? Like um, how how do you analyze it? I think you look at a series of actions. You have a starting point and you have an end goal, and you have a change path that allows you to go from your um, original objective to reach your goal. And this change path is a series of actions that you need to iterate, you need to go through to get where you want to go. But you can't start this change point until you know where you want to go. So the objective and the end point has to be defined before you start. And then you work together and you think about the process to go from stage A to stage B through this change mechanism. And there's a series of sort of diagrams that you can follow. There's a series of workshops <clears throat> um, that you can run for your, your team and think together. And they, these are very valuable activities because you work together as a team, think together as a team, um, and everybody brings to the table their own perspective, which is usually different from others. So you can have a collaboration moment along, let's say, the change change uh, path, and people bring into that path what they feel they can contribute, they feel is possible, and they feel is um, is welcome. And together, in this collaborative moment, you, you build up a process that allows you to reach your end goal. That's a, sort of one scenario. Uh -huh. And there's the impact playbook is a series of scenarios like this that allow you to um, evaluate and measure your changes and your the impact on the work that you've done. Yeah, because uh, I think that the measuring part is the difficult part. How do you transform everything you do into numbers so you can so you can measure it? You know, you, you need the standards. Yeah. You need a, I don't know KPIs. Uh, you know, you need to know how how well you're doing. So how you assess this impact? I think. But there's qualitative and there's quantitative measurements. Yeah. Okay, the qualitative. It's easy, you run a survey, you ask people, you count numbers. The qualitative is more difficult to ascertain and that's the human process. And that's a way to find words to describe what's happening, how you're, you're professionally or emotionally impacted by what you do. 
So the qualitative aspects are actually more difficult. So measuring is one part of it, but other, there are other phases to go through as well. I understand. Um, and uh, I would like to say that since you started in the beginning asking where people are from, we have a lot of people from Sao Paulo, a lot of people in the countryside of Sao Paulo. We also have people from other states, from Mato Grosso, from Santa Catarina, uh, that are watching us and and commenting. And there, there were some people that were interested in, in the webinars. So we sent the links for the webinars. Um, uh, people were, wanted to know about that too. And uh, um, I don't know, I think that's it. If anyone else has a question, the time is now, or else we can uh, we can proceed uh, to the end. Um, Paulo, do you want to ask anything? Uh, we have more people saying it was a, a great conference. Uh, thank you for your time and for speaking. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for joining me. Okay, then I will say goodbye to you all. Yes. Um, and find you all online. Yes. Uh, like, Paulo wants to say something. No, uh, Paulo, thank you. I think uh, so. Microphone, Paulo. Desculpe. Vou fazer uma pergunta no chat. Okay, Paulo is going to to ask something um, on the chat for us. Ah, we have people from Vienna too. Vienna. Uh, okay. Vienna, yes. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> uh, and thank you for, for the presentation. Um, so let me see. Um, okay, so I'm just going to wait for, for Paulo's um, question. Oh, actually, there was a, a question um, before uh, asking if, uh, I'm going to change it just a little bit so so you can answer. What do you think um, if European and all these projects, they are a positive aspect of um, globalization? I say it again, I'm not sure I understood the question. So if uh, the efforts of European, if everything that's being built, the archives, everything that's being reunited, all the people that are involved, if this is a positive aspect of globalization, of globalizing, it's an interesting question. Uh, probably not something I've thought about it. Um, Europe is the heart of the world. <laughs> I can't, I'm born and bred in Europe. So, you know, I see the Europe culture um, as being uh, Europe centric and I can't think of it any other way. I've never lived in America or South America or the Southeast um, Pacific. I can't see um, our, our perspective from anywhere else except European centric. So my my personal perspective is is from Europe and the cultural heritage of uh, Egypt, Greek, Latin, um, you know, traditions that I've grown up with and Europeana represents. Um, and possibly we can't see past our borders. But in terms of global reach, that we have 37 different languages or 27 active languages that uh, you can search on in Europe and Europeana, that means in itself we have a global reach because we can actually talk to people, people can talk to us in languages other than the Franco lingo of, uh, of, of English. You know, we can actually make our collections accessible, accessible internationally in terms of language. And that is quite um, global, I would think. I'm not sure if it's enough, but it's a start. Okay. Paolo, have you got your question coming? Yes. Um, Paolo uh, wants to know if you think it's viable to think of a Latin America or even a Brazilian uh, model of organization and diffusion of cultural uh, archives. Well, I'm sure that <laughs> I'm sure that Europeana will be very happy to share its model, EDM model, for example, or our communities model with uh, would be wonderful to, to share with Brazil, with South America, with anybody who'd be interested. Um, it's a model that can be exported and shared, absolutely. Um, we could start on a very small scale, um, maybe 
This is something that Harry spoke about yesterday. Did, did, they, did, he, did you broach on this yesterday with him, our director? Uh, he, He's the one to talk to, not me. <laughs> I see. Okay, thank you, Susan. And uh, I would like then to thank everyone that was uh, watching us, everyone that was participating, everyone that um, sent their questions and communicated. And uh, thank you, Susan, for her time and for everything. I think it was a great uh, presentation, an in-depth uh, presentation about European. I think we all understand a lot more of how it works. So thank you very much for that. Um, I think we're all interested, and um, and this is it for our session. Uh, I Can you join us? Come and sign up. Yes, come and sign up to Europeana. Uh, thank you, everybody. This was a session from Eva Minerva São Paulo, an event that is being organized by UNESP and our research group, Veredas Digitais, and I thank you uh, all, and that's it. Thank you, Nelson. Thank you. Thank you, Paulo. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Thank you. <laughs>